Welcome to Cause of Craft. I'm your host, John Tilton. Why do we create? Where do our ideas come from? What does our craft say about us? These are the ideas we explore here on the show. Each episode, I interview a different guest, from writers and painters to musicians and filmmakers. Together, we investigate the creative process and the reasons behind why we create. Food production has changed drastically over the years, and not always for the better. But is there any hope for returning to the old ways of doing things? This week's guest, Miller Mark Fisher, runs Castle Valley Mill, a stone ground mill where he uses machines that are hundreds of years old to produce quality flour, cornmeal, and more. By using age-old techniques on local grain, Castle Valley is able to produce a product that's not only better for you, but tastes better too. Mark shares how it all works in our conversation, and I'm very excited to share this episode with you. I think it's both incredibly interesting and incredibly important. These things not only impact our health, but also our local economies and the environment. So if you enjoy this episode, please share with a friend, because the more people who understand the value of how our food is made and where it comes from, the healthier we'll all be in the future. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Mark. It's good to have you on. Delighted to be here, John. Nice to be talking to you again. So can you give us a little bit of an overview of this mill that you guys own and how it came into your possession and just the story behind it? Sure. It's kind of a neat story. It covers multiple generations. It covers like things that are going on in the food industry. Um, but the, the shortest version is my grandfather, um, Henry Fisher. He was a miller from Bavaria, Germany, and he lived and worked at the family mill there, which was in his family for generations. His father died, his mother remarried, and the new guy was younger. So my grandfather was the oldest of three sons, and he would have inherited the mill, but with a new guy around, that wasn't going to happen for a while. So he decided to uh, seek his fortunes elsewhere and immigrated to the United States around 1920, I guess. Classic immigrant story, came here with nothing, you know, just knew some family people, worked hard, saved his money, made smart decisions, and uh, ended up building a, a business that was his life's work, which was a moving company, uh, Fisher's Transfer. But he never got the milling thing out of his out of his genes. He, it's really kind of, I guess it's genetic because here I am, you know, two generations later doing it. But um, he was he was an expert miller when he left, and he actually worked at different mills in the area. He uh, was a consultant when Henry Ford built his mill. The uh, the millwright who built it would visit him and and you know talk to him, talk to my grandfather. I never knew this until later, but he apparently was a big deal. Um, but he found this place, Castle Valley, in uh, 1946, I guess, and it was very run down, as were many old grist mills, old water powered grist mills at that time, because it was just, you know, old technology, the milling industry, the, the way they made flour had moved on, power production had moved on from water to, you know, steam and electric and, and everything else. So these things were kind of white elephants. And if you didn't have a reason to keep it up, they were not kept up. And being right by a, a water source by the creek, you know everything is is trying to destroy the building you know the the water and the <laughs> the weather and the the animals and everything else so when he found the place it was pretty run down he bought it and then spent a year restoring it mostly restoring the house which was also kind of run down so we're in a property which includes uh the mill a dam the uh the house beautiful three story stone house um, a barn and some other outbuildings, a smokehouse, a spring house. You know, it was really quite the thing in the 1800s. But he bought it, moved the family in after he restored the house and lived here for the rest of his life. So as a kid growing up, when we visited grandma and grandfather, we'd come here. And it, it was just kind of a magical place, you know, right by the water. You had all the stuff you could do in a creek, like fish or chase crayfish or look for snakes or whatever. It was kind of a big property for a little kid and seemed enormous. Um, and it was always kind of the, the nuclear center or the nucleus of, of our family was Castle Valley where grandma and grandfather lived. So you'd come here for, you know, events or Christmas or you'd visit or all that stuff. And I just, you know, I always thought it was just the coolest place. I mean, honestly, just looking out every day, my front yard is a 125 foot long 
waterfall, you know, so that's, that's what I look at. And we've got ducks and geese and deer and eagles and everything just flies by. So when my grandmother passed away, nobody in the family really wanted the property or could afford the property. You know, it's kind of a big place. My wife and I, after some negotiation with uh, each other, agreed that we will make a pitch and we'll make the basically the, the estate an offer. And we ended up buying the place and then moved in with our three kids and started all over. So we lived here for, well, we've been here for about 25 years, give or take, and really lived here for 10 or 15 years. And the mill was just this big kind of rundown dark building, just absolutely full of stuff, literally floor to ceiling stuff. Some of it was antique stuff. Some of it was parts of machinery. Some of it was, you know, someone's books from college or old furniture. The way nature hates a vacuum, stuff hates closed space or <laughs> covered space. So if you have an old barn or if you have a anything, a shed, uh, your family's going to know about it, and you're going to start having to store everybody's crap for you know, <laughs> for a hundred years. So we had over 150 years of everybody's crap in the mill. But long story short, after uh, selling out of another business, I had some time on my hands, and I'm like, well, eh, I should I should maybe fix something. You know, the the, the original plan was just to kind of fix enough machinery or or rebuild a little mill so that I could make some cornmeal, sell it at farmer's markets, and, you know, maybe make enough to help maintain the building. Never did I envision running an entire business, like getting the whole mill running again. But that's kind of one thing led to another. And here we are. We, uh, we're we an authentic stone ground grist mill buying grains from local farmers and selling to mostly restaurants in the tri-state area. So, We've got our product in restaurants I can't afford to eat in, in New York City, down to Philadelphia, Washington, D.C. The chefs can't believe there's an authentic stone mill within 30 miles of them. And we can't believe what these chefs are turning out with our product, which is a very basic, authentic, but wholesome and natural product. So that's where we're at. That's amazing. Um, so much to unpack there. <laughs> so it really feels like it was that the feeling of being on the property that kind of drew you to it in the first place. It, it wasn't so much the milling itself. That was almost an afterthought that became the business later. Yeah. I mean, I did not, you know, so when I was in high school say, man, I want to be a miller. I've had a very circuitous route to doing this. And honestly, if I didn't have other businesses that I sold out of before, I'd never be in a position because I was able, when I sold out of my last business, I was able to work for, you know, hire myself as the general contractor, laborer and gopher for um, three years restoring this place. And uh, it took a lot of work. A lot of people volunteered, a lot of help from, I mean, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for some people who just showed up on my doorstep. So, my wife and I always says, you know, it was this is clearly something that God had in mind because I could never have orchestrated the kind of people that showed up to help. So, yeah, it's just the original thought was to just help the build, you know, help the building do enough to help maintain itself. It's a beautiful building, but it's huge, you know. It's it's a four-story stone and post and beam building, you know, and the the roof was rotting out and the siding needed to be replaced and you know, just on and on and on. So we didn't, I didn't start by saying, hey, I want to be a miller and get into this local food movement. That stuff just sort of happened at the right time. And so you mentioned all these restaurants and chefs who are, they just can't believe that there's an actual stone mill. Do you know some of the reasons why behind, is it the maintenance in general that people just haven't kept up with? Or, or why is it such a rare find these days? I tell people we're the grass fed beef of the flower world. <laughs> so, and that's a good analogy because it's, you know, making a grass fed steak, it takes a lot of time, um, a lot of effort. It's expensive. It's not commercial food by any stretch of the imagination. You know, you're not going to, McDonald's isn't making grass fed hamburgers, you know. The industrialization of food changed the way that flour was made, is made, and has turned it into a product that is literally 
uh, absent of nutrition and flavor by design. That's what they want to do to the point where in the 40s, when, uh, you know, our country was gearing up for war and, and getting all these young men to show up, they realized uh, these, these kids are malnourished because they've been eating white flour, which has got all of the bran and all of the germ of the seed taken out of it and has no nutrition. So the government said, by law, if you're making white flour, you have to add eight essential vitamins and minerals to the food so that people don't are not malnourished because we eat so much flour in our diet. And that's when you when you pick up a bag of flour, it says fortified and enriched with eight essential vitamins and minerals. That's not a good thing. They took out something like 40 vitamins and minerals, and they only put back the eight that are required by law so that it's actually food and not just empty starch. So, you know, when, when we show up or when anyone who's doing stone ground, stone ground flour is much slower to produce. Uh, it's got a shelf life. You know, it, it won't last. It will go bad if you leave it sitting on a loading dock in the middle of the summer for a month. So you have to handle it more like produce than you do, you know, you would talcum powder. Modern flour is just terrible. Uh, and that's why everyone's having problems with wheat. It's not wheat. It's it's like as if you were eating styrofoam all the time instead of real protein. <laughs> well, yeah, this is super interesting to me too because I haven't cut flour out of my diet completely, but I've noticed that I usually don't feel the best after it. Yeah. And so now I'm like, well, because I see you guys ship not only to, or I guess, do you have limitations on where you ship because of, like you said, it has to be treated like produce or where all can you get the flour? Yeah, you can, we, we have an online store. You can buy it from anywhere. Um, the thing is we offer free shipping um, for, you know, a certain amount of product, but that's only within like two UPS zones. So if you're outside of those zones, you're going to have to pay the shipping. And unfortunately that flour is heavy. So by the time someone orders, you know, 10 pounds of grits, it, it can be a little pricey if you're in California, but you don't have to treat it like it's not sushi. It's not meat. So it's not like it's going to go bad in a day. It's just, we're all used to flour being like salt. You stick it in the pantry. You don't think about it until you're ready to use it because it has no shelf life because there's nothing good in it anymore. Our stuff has the the germ of a seed. So a seed has got three components. It's got the germ, which is the living plant in its little embryonic uh, suspended animation stage. It's got the um, bran, which is kind of the outside covering, which has got a lot of vitamins in it, but it really protects the rest of the seed. And then you've got the endosperm, which is the starch. So when a seed germinates, when it's you know warm and, and damp in the ground at the right time, that little embryo wakes up. All this magic happens with proteins that I don't understand. It converts the starch to sugar, which is the food for that little plant. And it's got everything it needs. It's like an egg. It's got everything it needs for the plant to grow and send down roots and pop up and start to photosynthesize. Um, it's all in that seed. And when you when humans eat it, you're getting all of that nutrition. So you have starch and vitamins and minerals and potassium and niacin and all that good stuff. But modern flour removes all of the bran and all of the germ, and you only end up with the starch. So it's, like I said, it's like eating styrofoam. It's, there's nothing good in it. So can you walk us through the process of, like, where does it start for you to, so are you getting, you're getting grain in? Or again, I, I feel like I... It's hard to ask questions so specifically because I just am not in the know about these things. Can you describe like what a typical day looks like for you creating your product? Sure. So we start, um, I was going to say we start from the seed, but we, we actually start before that because we are not farmers. But so we contract and work with farmers to grow what we want. So it really starts with finding someone who's willing to you know, take the risk. So the, the kinds of grains that we mill here are not your industrial scale wheat. Um, and that's another problem with modern wheat is they're using a, a variety or a genetic wheat that has been bred for specific traits. And none of them have to do with flavor or nutrition. Everything has to do with production. Because they're um, taking everything out of it, they really don't care if it tastes good or not, because at the end, it tastes like nothing. The next time you're out at a restaurant, next time you're out, you know, uh, wherever, 
um, and they serve bread, right? Unless the bread's got something in it. If it's just the, the white bread, even if it's a baguette or something like that, just like close your eyes and taste it and say, what does that taste like? And it's going to taste like nothing. Bread these days tastes like what you put in it or what you put on it, but it doesn't have flavor. Wheat, there are thousands of varieties of wheat, and they can taste completely different. If you go to the ancient grains, like emmer is sweet, it's chewy, it's very, very hard. On the other side of the spectrum would be like spelt, which almost tastes like oatmeal. It's softer. It's got a very fullness to it. Um, it's still wheat, but it's different. So we work with farmers to grow stuff that, that we want to mill, you know, and we want our target is stuff that tastes good because no matter how good it would be for you, no one's going to buy something because it's good for you, right? I mean, no one's going to eat something because it's good for you. That's that's medicine, right? That's It's not fun, but they're going to eat something. They're going to spend more if it tastes good. So real good varieties of wheat taste good and are good for you. So we work with these farmers. They end up growing what you know we ask for. They harvest it. We buy it from them, and then we store it in these big grain bins. When we're ready to mill, we draw it off of the grain bin through a system that puts it into a bunch of cleaning machines or uh, cleaning systems in the mill. So in the old days, a mill both cleaned the grain and milled the grain, the, the wheat or corn or whatever. So we're kind of one step off the farm. So a typical day would be, um, okay, we're going to mill whatever hard wheat. So I will have either the day before or uh, that day, I'll pull in a ton of wheat from our outside bins through this uh, auger system. It goes to the very tip top of the mill and falls into this antique cleaning machine that we've restored. These All of the machinery we use is like 150 years old and th it works like a charm. They really haven't improved on the technology of grain cleaning that much over the last 150 years. They had it. They were smart guys back in the 1850s. They, they figured this stuff out. And that's one of the reasons I like it is because the machines are, they're beautiful. They're functional. They're just ingenious the way they work. So you clean wheat or you clean any kind of a grain through a combination of uh, blowing air through it to move like light stuff. Uh, running it over screens to remove big stuff like pieces of corn cob or pieces of straw, different screens to remove little stuff like dirt or, you know, crunched up bits that you don't want. So you aspirate it, you screen it, you sift it, you sieve it, um, you rub it against each other. There's all these different machines that do different things to the grain. And at the end of that process, you end up with a super clean, happy, healthy uh, wheat berry. You call them berries. So a seed of wheat. Uh, and you end up with millions of them because you've got a ton of this stuff. Then we um, put it into a hopper that feeds into one of our stone mills. The stone mills, um, it's a one-pass system. So the piece of grain is fed in and it gets milled or milling is, you would think of it as a crushing process, but it's more of a cutting process. So the stones are very, very hard, They're almost as hard as a diamond. And they've got very flat, very true and, and kind of sharp surfaces to them, almost like sandpaper. One of them spins, one of them doesn't. The grain comes in and gets caught between them, and then it gets cut into tiny little particles, and that's your flour. The flour is then moved into a bolting room where it goes through a sifting process. So if we're making different products, um, sometimes we sift it, sometimes we don't. So whole wheat is not sifted. It's 100% of what came out of the mill goes into the bag. Bolted wheat has got the big pieces of bran sifted out, but it's still got a lot of bran and all of the germ mixed throughout. Uh, things like grits and cornmeal, those literally are just, it's corn, but it's different particle sizes of the corn. Um, and it cooks up differently, sort of like uh, angel hair pasta versus, uh, you know, a spaghetti or something. So then it gets milled and then it goes in through our bagging machines into in our bagging room. And we use modern bagging machines or not. We, when we started, we were hand scooping everything into little two pound bags, but we've grown beyond that. So we have these uh, auger fillers that weigh out the amount and then we seal them and pack them up and ship them out to our customers. That is all super fascinating. And I can very much understand why as if I was a restaurant owner, why I'd be 
all for you know bringing your product on board. <laughs> um, you mentioned early on that you didn't realize that it was going to turn into what it is today. <laughs> right. What was the moment that you realized that there was demand for for this process? So we started. Uh... I, I started by just rebuilding one little mill, a little 12 inch mill from 1878. You know, it's, uh, it was sitting there. It looked like something that you would throw out because it was dirty. It was in pieces. It was, you know, there was bits and pieces of it everywhere, but all the pieces were there. I figured out how they all went together. I sandblasted everything, cleaned everything, sharpened the stones and made this little mill and it, it you know, it could run and it could make cornmeal and grits and whole wheat. And we just packed it in a little two pound bags. And I, went to a local farmer's market here, Stockton Market, and we rented a little booth and started, you know, just selling our flour in little two pound bags, you know, and there are other vendors there. So you could buy, like I said, grass fed beef, or you could buy specialty donuts, or you could buy seafood. And, you know, here we were selling flour. (laughs) So uh, I know it's weird, but now and then, uh, like a, a chef would be, you know, out there shopping for his whatever, and he'd, he'd oh, okay, fine, and he'd buy something, cornmeal. And then, like a week later, we'd be there, you know, we were there every Saturday. They'd come back, and they're like, that was the best polenta I've made in my yeah. life. What I've been doing this for 30, what are you doing? And I'm like, <laughs> um, we're grinding it on old mills, and that's it. <laughs> so we realized that what we were doing by not over-processing the food made a better food. So, you know, if you take an apple and smush it up and and dehydrate it and, you know, run it through something to take out the this chemical and add that and put color in it, by the time you're done, it's, you know, it's apple soda. It's not an apple. And it has none of the benefits of the original apple. And that's what white flour pretty much has become. So what we're doing is just basically keeping the food the way God made it. All we're doing is crushing it up a little bit, you know, making it smaller, but it's fresh and it's done, you know, at low temperatures and it's comes from very good source material. So the grains are the wheat or the corn is it's all non GMO and it's all got flavor naturally. And that's what ends up in the food. So we realized maybe we're onto something. So at that point, one thing led to another, I'm like, okay, I'll rebuild another mill okay, I got to rebuild. Uh, we need a, we need to sift this stuff. You know, we can't go through this little thing. We got a, a bigger thing. Oh, here's a sifting machine from, you know, 1822. Let's uh, tear it all apart and rebuild it and see if it works. And one thing led to another and here we are. And that guy's experience is, is such a cool one too, because I think when people hear about the process and everything on one end can sometimes feel like theory. It's like, well, this one's made with love and that one's, you know, the big, the big, uh, producer, you know, yeah. Right. yeah, the man is making the other one and then we're the small guys and ours tastes better. Yeah. But having that guy not know at all what you did, but come back and have had this experience that he's been cooking forever and it's the best version. I mean, that's got to make you feel good that, okay, this is, this is something beyond just the idea of, going back to the olden times, it's, it's actually a better process. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's one of those things. And there, I think there are a lot of things that in our current state of society that have not gotten better with speed and volume. Some things have, you know, um, internet communication shoes, you know, they've gotten better, but a lot of the food that we eat has really been the, the manufacturing process for most of our food is designed on for volume and cheap. So you want to make it faster and cheaper and it does not get better. Um, the better stuff is the slow stuff. You know, uh, uh, 200 years ago, the only flour that could be had was freshly ground flour because we didn't have refrigeration. The only duck you could ever eat was a duck that was walking around this morning, you know, and you, cause you'd, you'd kill it and eat it and cook it. And that was fresh. So we've gotten to the point where we can make a crap ton of it. We can ship it all over the world. It doesn't go bad. You you grab the next time you're in the grocery store, reach for the very back of the King Arthur stack of flour and look at the date. It's probably a year old, <clears throat> and there's no difference, you know, between the stuff that's fresh because they they've taken all the the things that would decay over time out of it. So yeah, in this in this case, what we're doing is just keeping it closer to the original food product. We're just making it into something that you can bake with. 
Something else that stuck out to me so far through this conversation is the way you were describing the machinery and you have this kind of love for the machinery. Is machinery in your background with your other work? Or I know uh, just from personally knowing you that you enjoy uh, airplanes. Yeah. Is this all connected in some way? Um, I guess it has to be. I mean, I'm in a, like I'm an engineer by education. I'm an electrical engineer. So I've always liked how things work. So I always like mechanical things. I've always tinkered with stuff, you know, cars or, or airplanes or, you know, so that's always been an interest of mine. And then once I figured out what this machinery was and how it works, um, I realized that it was a really cool design. I mean, it was a very, you know, these, these things were designed in the mid 1800s on pencil and paper. They're with a slide rule, maybe. And they tried different things. It, it's really a lot of this machinery. I tell people, you look at it. This is the epitome of um, American ingenuity. And in the 1800s, we were kicking the world's ass in flour production to the point where the Prussians, now the Germans, sent spies to the U.S. to figure out what are these guys doing that's making such better quality flour than us. And it's pretty neat. There's a, a the report from these spies um, has been translated back into English, and you know I've got a copy of it. And uh, it, it's funny. It's you know they're, they're just amazed at all these ways that we're cleaning the grains and sifting the flour and and doing. It's things that we we take for granted today, like a, um, a conveyor belt system or a method of conveying grain in a little bucket elevator. You know, a little scoop by scoop going to the top of the mill. That was all new back then. Matter of fact, the guy who changed milling in the U.S. most significantly. He was a Philadelphia native. Um, his name's Oliver Evans. And he got the third patent in the United States, number three. And it's a patent for improving flour mills. And it was a system patent in 1790, I think. So he patented the idea of moving grain and flour through the building two different processes using elevator systems and augers and you know, spiral things. And, and basically it's an assembly line. Prior to that, everything was done by picking it up, dumping it in, scooping it out, picking it up, dumping it in, scooping it out. It was a very manual start and stop process that required a lot of people lifting a lot of stuff all day long. Oliver Evans basically built a system that fed every machine and took it away from every machine in a continuous process. And you could run a mill with two people. Brilliant. American ingenuity. So I, I appreciate that. And the machinery that we use is all kind of built in that heyday of making really good machinery that no one else thought of. So there was that time where after your grandfather had kind of rebuilt the mill, it then went out of commission and then you brought it back in. Do you think a lot about the future? And, you know, once, whenever you decide to retire, how the <laughs> mill will continue? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and that's a good question because you know the the two things as a business person you think of is scalability and um, lineage. Like, what's going to happen? Can I sell it when I'm done? And just to uh, clarify, my grandfather never got the mill running. Oh, okay. He collected milling machinery from all over the place. So when a mill would be, he had a moving company, so he could move heavy things. Um, so when a mill would be torn down, he'd go and uh, basically salvage machinery or parts or things that he thought would be useful. So that all that stuff was in the mill in pieces. Wow. Okay. So he collected it and he did save the building from falling into the creek, rebuilt some piers. He put in some beams. I mean, he structurally saved it, but he never had it anywhere close to actually being a mill again. It was basically a large storage facility for antique milling machinery and parts. Um, so to answer your question, yeah, the I mean, this mill... I found a flow sheet actually tacked to the back of the office door from uh, the late 1800s, and it, it showed the, the flow through the mill and uh, the amount of flour that they were able to produce out of this building on water power was staggering. I mean, it was like 5,000 pounds a day or something. You know, we typically do two to 3,000 pounds a day with electric lights and, uh, and electricity. <laughs> so 
they were cranking out the flower and it was pretty cool. So we can scale this up. We can make more here. I think in the not too distant future, I, I have to start thinking of how do I get the same processes, the same stone milling, you know, grain cleaning, all that stuff um, running, but maybe in, in a facility that is a little easier to manage because when we have a flood, you know, it's a problem. We're working in a, in a building that's, that was built in 1798. So the floors aren't really level. So, you know, as you are rolling something from one side to the next, it's going to kind of roll downhill a little bit. So I think at some point, I, I always want to be able to produce in this mill because the worst thing you can do for a machine is not use it. That's when it starts to decay. So I always want to be producing something and, and we may eventually end up doing the, the grain cleaning here, or maybe we'll just do one product here, like just our heirloom grits will be produced here. But what I'd like to do is is get another facility that's you know a little more modern with three-phase electric and tall ceilings and concrete floors and whatever, and produce the product still off of stone mills, still you know the same way, but not necessarily in this building. Because honestly, you know, our house is right next to the building. So I would never sell the, the business, you know, I live here. So that's that's probably something in the back of my mind that, you know, eventually we're going to want to scale into a different space. And if you read the book that uh, Bob, is it Roberts? Bob's Red Mill. I don't know if you've ever seen their product, but Bob's Red Mill is a very popular stone ground business. And he's in, uh, I think, Redmond, Washington. Um, it, that's how he was able to, you know, grow. Unfortunately, his mill burned down, so he had to get another place. But you got to move into a, a facility that can handle scaling it up. I think in the East Coast, you know, from New York to D.C., we could produce a lot more stone ground, high quality flour if I can line up the farmers and, you know, find the market. So at some point, there's going to be a limit to what we can produce out of my mill. But I, I always want things running in my mill. Another thing I'm always super impressed by is on your Castle Valley Mill Instagram page. <laughs> there's always these images that are shared of just the incredible dishes that people make using your product. Castle Valley Creations, it's called. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just spectacular paging through them. And I'll share these, of course, on on our website and in the show notes. But has there been anything that surprised you where you thought, oh, wow, that's not something I would expect to see being created with my flower? Yeah, that's fun um, because if you hashtag Castle Valley Creations, um, my wife, Fran or Deming, will kind of go through them. And then like once a week, they'll put together 10 pictures and you can click on the picture and, and go to their creation. But you see these incredibly beautiful food presentations that these people, some of it is just uh, like, here's a great sourdough bread. Some of it is, you know, uh, unobtainium on a bed of can't get it, you know, with our flour or our grits and, you know, with these little dots of perfection around the plate, they're just beautiful. Um, but that, yeah, that's, that's a lot of fun. I think some of the things that probably the thing that blew me away and I never thought of doing this, but it was a, uh, a, a red cornmeal bambino, which ended up, it looks like a big ball and it's basically corn pudding, you know, in this, it's a dessert. And most of what, you know, I think you make from our stuff is bread and pasta and corn, cornmeal and, you know, stuff like that. But I was like, oh, wow. That's so we ended up making bambinos and that was really good. The prettiest things are always the, um, the sweets, you know, the cakes and the truffles and things like that. But, you know, some of the, the cool things are just, you know, what they're doing with cornmeal and betting, betting a piece of fish on emmer, you know, like just the pairings of how they mix the flavors together and the presentations are great. We talked about the, your interest in the machinery and in the property itself and how those two things kind of brought you to the mill. Were you ever really into food before this or have you gained a new appreciation for it by doing this work? Yeah, in doing this, I kind of unpacked what we've been eating for the last, you know, couple hundred years. Um, I did get a real education on industrial food production versus 
I guess, real food production, I trademarked very early on a phrase, real food dash is good. And that's on the back of our t-shirts. That's on every one of our packages. And that literally is what, you know, we're kind of built around. Real food is good. It's good for you. It's good tasting. It's good for the economy. It's good for the environment. The less you process it, the better. So I don't want to say I'm a foodie. We we have been blessed with um, being invited, like I said, to some of the restaurants that I can't afford to eat in, like per se, in, in New York City or um, La Pavillon that just opened up. You know, they, they've got olive trees in this restaurant, <laughs> full size olive trees, and we were we were invited to the to the opening or Danielle Balud. These names, you know, these are equivalent to the French Laundry in California, and they're using our product. And we've had the blessings of being able to, you know, eat some of that stuff there um, at their invitation. So I have a, an appreci- a much better appreciation for what real food is and what crap food is and how, you know, chicken nuggets and French fries are pretty much killing us, as is white flour and white sugar. Uh, white flour and white sugar probably makes up 30% or actually probably 60% of most people's diet. And that creates a glycemic spike and you get diabetes and you have heart problems and it doesn't, you know, it's, it's, you're overwhelming your taste buds with salt and sugar all the time, but real food is good. You know, it's, you just back off to kind of closer to the way God made it and, and just eat the apple, you know, don't over process the apple, enjoy it, have a good apple. Don't have a, uh, you know, a red delicious, which has been bred to have a shelf life and be giant and be super red with no consideration for the flavor. You know, if you eat a uh, Cavill Blanc, it tastes like a wine. You know, it's phenomenal. It's a, it's an apple, but it's a harder to grow. So I've had, I, I guess I've, I've learned a more sensitivity and just a more understanding of uh, what good real food is. And how did you come across all this information? Um, like, were there certain books that you were researching this? I can kind of imagine how you'd have come to know more about the flower in general, but just you mentioning like the apple and stuff like this. I'm just thinking for, if only for my sake, but I, I would think the listeners as well would be interested in furthering their own education on how to find different products that are better to eat. Yeah, the apples, I had this vision of uh, planting an apple orchard, and I actually planted 20 trees, and I wanted old varieties. Um, I had heard a, a report about old varieties of apples and how they just tasted incredible, and I'm like, I want that. So I planted all these trees. It didn't do great because the voles killed half of them, and one day, one day I mean, oh, I worked hard on this little tiny apple orchard, and one day I see one of my trees walking down towards the creek, and I'm like, that's odd. and I walk up to it and here's this beaver the size of a dog that had <laughs> chopped down my tree and was dragging it into the creek and I'm like shoot never thought that would happen <laughs> um hazards of living by by water I guess so yeah I just you know I sort of researched it I guess if look, the way they eat in Europe in Italy and France even in uh you know Belgium even in gosh you can any of the old countries, you know, that really are that are kind of traditionalists, that's more real food. The way we eat in America is very processed. I think in France, they actually in, in school, they, they have like lunch class you know, where they teach you different foods and you eat a good lunch and you, you, you learn about food, you know, real food and where it comes from and how it's made. And, you know, 90 percent of the kids would have no idea where a chicken nugget comes from just shows up from McDonald's, you know, but chickens are things too. And, and you, you can have different kinds of chickens and you can breed chickens for flavor. So yeah, I guess just looking at traditional foods where you don't have preservation, um, preservation is great. I love my refrigerator, you know, and, and I like the fact that you can put something in a jar and and it's still going to be fresh, but sometimes preservation uh, as the default ends up messing up the food and it's all about just preserving it when it kind of reminds me of you know all whether it be arts or just things in life in general it always seems that life has a way about rewarding the extra work that goes into something like like if i was to be when i'm writing my books or doing any sort of activity 
it's very rare that the the shortest way through the path <laughs> gives you the best result, right? And I don't know what it is about that, but there's something about just what goes into the process. And and like you were saying before, it feels like a lot of the decisions that are made for a mass scale or based upon, okay, how do we make it cheaper and how do we make it at scale and how do we make it produce it faster when really it's a different set of questions that we should be asking. Yeah. And when it comes to, I mean, I, I agree with you um, in many cases, in some cases, you know, doing it the hard way is not the best way to do it. But in, I think in the, in some things, it's the only good way to do it. I had a conversation with a guy who, came to the mill once and he he said, I worked in the cereal industry. And he said, I literally was in meetings where the discussion was how much sugar can we put into this cereal and still get away with it legally and ethically? No, I'm sorry, legally. Forget the ethics. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, literally, he's, the guy was like just flabbergasted. And he's like, that was his business. And my job was how much sugar can I put into a children's cereal? He's like, that's I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> so I remember looking at different cereals. I don't know if I should name them outright, but cereals that it's like, oh, I grew up thinking this is a healthy cereal. <laughs> right. And when I got, you know, a little more informed about how much sugar is in our food and I started being more conscious about that, I took a box of this particularly uh, famous cereal and looked at the sugar contents and my eyes like became three times the size when I realized that, wait, that's how much sugar is in the container of ice cream per serving. Right, yeah. It, a small bowl of cereal is equivalent to ice cream and sugar. Yeah. And I was like, that's that's not right. Yeah, so, you, you think it's a healthy OD cereal, and, and here it's 26 grams of sugar in there. I did. I, I had a small group through our church. I had these kids from seventh grade to, to senior. And one day, we're sitting at the table, and I said, okay, here's a little scale. I'm going to start pouring sugar onto this scale. Stop <laughs> me when you think I've hit the amount of sugar that's in a Coke that you drink every day. And, <laughs> you know, started pouring. They're like, stop. And I'm like, nope, man, stop. No, stop. Please, no, stop. And I'm like, there you go. <laughs> nine tablespoons, nine tablespoons of sugar in a 12-ounce Coca-Cola that these kids are just having a couple a day. You know, of course, they're having health problems. <laughs> it's, it doesn't take much to realize how bad the American diet is and how easy it could be a little better. But, you know, nobody cooks at home anymore. So although the pandemic changed that, our the sales, our home sales uh, during the pandemic were insane, absolutely insane because our restaurants all shut down so that we could literally legally could not sell to these poor people who were closed by law. Um, but then flour became a commodity that you couldn't get. Who who would ever think that would that would be like? I don't even know what that would be like. I mean, that, that would be like <laughs> something that is just always there, all of a sudden not there. You know, like electricity or something. So our online sales went absolutely through the stratosphere to the point where we stopped making everything else except three products that we could do as fast as possible. And we were shipping uh, all over the country. 11% of our sales went to California because they were in lockdown. And people wow. had to eat. They, 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 and they weren't buying two-pound bags. They were buying 30 pounds of flour <laughs> you know, to live off of for the next – it was crazy. And they have your flour, and they're like, well, this is the best bread I ever it, made, just like that guy who came yeah. by the farmer's and market. And that's what happened. And, and I think there was a real awakening to yeah, – I mean, even people who were using – we call it crappy flour, but, you know, regular flour, but you're baking your own stuff at home. They're like, oh, my gosh, this is so much better. Because if you here's the other thing, go out and look at a hamburger bun and look at the ingredients. First off, you can't pronounce 20 percent of what's there, um, which is bad. And I'm a big fan of clean label. Like you have to be able to know what it I don't know what guar gum is. I don't know what a guar tree looks like. And I don't really want it in my food. You'll see that, you know, it starts off with wheat flour and sugar's high on there, but then there's gluten, wheat gluten as an ingredient added to that because commercial flour or commercial bread has been designed to go from the flour to the packaged product within two hours. Sourdough bread can, can take two days just to let it ferment and rise. And all this beautiful magic is going on there with proteins and enzymes. And again, things I don't understand, but it's creating nutrition. It's freeing up the nutrition and the flavor for you. Um, they're putting extra gluten in 
these baked products to make them rise faster. So it's called a conditioner, as well as these other weird things I can't pronounce. And then they're putting in preservatives so that it'll sit on the shelf for, you know, four weeks and not go bad. So it's not even, you know, people are complaining, I can't eat bread. Well, you're not eating bread. You're eating bread with all these chemicals in it. Just eat bread. It's great. Wow. Well, this has been super enlightening. <laughs> I loved hearing all about every just everything you know from the process and also just about our food and what we're eating in general. I've already been on kind of on a path to try to eat better in general, but I feel like now I'm much better informed and I'm excited to, to implement. Like one of the things I did was, and again, maybe you know more about this than, than I do, but for sugar in particular, I've been trying to s- switch to natural sweeteners, still using less sugar in general, but when I have to have sugar, I have a big sweet tooth <laughs> using something like local honey or something like oh, yeah. that instead of... Yeah. But flat, bread is something that I really miss. I have it every now and then, but I'm really excited to get my hands on some of what you guys produce at your mill and see how I feel after eating it. And I'm almost more looking forward to how it's going to taste. Yeah. You you seem like an adventurous guy. There's the a stone simple, it's called a no need bread recipe, and I'll send it to you. It's the easiest thing. And it, before you go to bed, you mix three ingredients three things in a bowl and then you just stick it in the corner of your kitchen it rises overnight and in the morning you pretty much dump it out and then uh, put it into a um, Dutch oven you know what a Dutch oven is yeah and you stick that in your stove in your oven for half an hour and you get this perfect perfect loaf of bread every time easiest thing to do I mean I I am not a bread baker I can make flat breads all day long but I, I don't I'm not don't have time to do a sourdough and fold it and knead it and, you know, wait two hours and do something else. But this, uh, this overnight bread or no need bread recipe is so easy. And you, you dump it out and you're like, Oh my gosh, this is fantastic. I'm never going to buy bread again. Um, and real easy to do. So all you need is a Dutch oven and, uh, that's all you need. And where can people purchase your flour and where can they see pictures of your mill and just learn more about Castle Valley Mill? Yes, um, everything's on our website, which is uh, castlevalleymill.com. One word, Castle Valley Mill. Uh, we, our store is right there. You can order any of our products. We ship UPS. Um, if you're within two zones and you order more than $35, shipping's free. Uh, if you're outside of that, you know, split it up, or get get a couple people and buy buy a bunch of stuff and then split it up between you to save on the shipping cost. But uh, there's there's some history. There's pictures. You can also uh, follow us on Instagram, which is uh, CV Mill LLC or CVM LLC. I've got it in front of me now. I was looking at those pictures when we were talking. It's CVM LLC. There you go. CVM LLC. We'll have links to those in the show notes too. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you can see stuff, beautiful stuff that our customers make. And we often will post, you know, just, hey, this is what we're doing today. Hey, we cleaned out the mill pit. Hey, here's a snake. You know, we're, it's like you sort of kind of <laughs> see what we do. Uh, it's a fun place to work. It's, you know, we're, it's beautiful. It's hard work. This is the hardest work I've ever done in my life. And it's also probably the most fulfilling. So, It's cool. Well, that's awesome. Thanks so much again, Mark, for sharing everything. It was great talking to you about this, and I really appreciate you coming on the show. Great. uh, Happy to do it. And uh, yeah, if there are any questions, just follow up or send us, uh, use our little form on our website and, and ask us anything. We'll get right back to you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Cause of Craft. You can learn more about Castle Valley Mill and purchase their product at castlevalleymill.com. You can also follow them on Instagram at CVMLLC. Links in the show notes. I also appreciate everyone who has reviewed the show on Apple Podcasts. And for those of you who listen on Spotify, you'll be happy to know that they've recently implemented reviews there as well. So please leave a five-star review on your favorite platform and share the podcast with a friend. These two things really help the show grow. And if you have feedback, suggestions, or guest recommendations, send an email to john at causeofcraft.com. That's j-o-n at causeofcraft.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.